Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, our facilitator uh, of the program uh, this afternoon, uh, Ms. Kena, uh, Mamantiki Bigo and the entire Bigo family, uh, our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Professor Gordon, uh, who we're looking forward to be um, uh, hearing from uh, him this afternoon. Uh, Professor Settler from our School of um, uh, Religion and, Ph and Philosophy uh, and Classics uh, at the Peter Marisbeck campus. Uh, Professor, I mean, all uh, academics are present here. Our members uh, of all, all the members that are here are from the uh, university community, uh, academics, uh, professional services uh, staff, as well as uh, a, well, a warm welcome to our board uh, and patrons of UMTAPO, uh, all the political uh, business and religious leaders that are present here. Uh, our veterans also uh, in the struggle uh, for South Africa's freedom. Um, we are extending a very special welcome uh, to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, also uh, people from other universities that have joined us uh, uh, within South Africa, the African continent, and also across the globe. I am uh, honored to welcome you to the 2023 Steve Vigo uh, Lecture, which we are hosting uh, this afternoon. Uh, the theme for this, uh, this year's lecture, as you all know, is Vigo's uh, 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 quest, Vigo's uh, uh, um quest for the humanity in, in a South Africa that is in institutional and uh, moral uh, decay. We are honored uh, to have our, our speaker, our guest speaker this evening, uh, Professor Gordon, a distinguished scholar and our uh, facilitator, Ms. Kenna, who's going to help us unpack uh, this topic uh, this evening. Most of us uh, will agree that uh, this is such an important uh, topic uh, especially given the state of our nation and also um, and, and, and the challenges we face um, that we all know about. Uh, in moments of collective um, uh, introspection such as this, we often tend to the past, uh, drawing inspiration and wisdom from the experiences and uh, teachings of uh, visionary leaders like uh, Steve Beagle. As the Investor Kwazulu Natal, uh, we are proud to continue to host uh, this lecture. Uh, this is so uh, uh, because uh, we are we are constantly um, we constantly strive uh, to be a, at a center for intellectual debate uh, as an institution where ideas uh, bloom. We want to be uh, at the center of all the efforts seeking solutions uh, to the challenges uh, continuing. Um, uh, confronting our country uh, and the globe. We are also uh, proud to be um, uh, of being associated with the legacy of Steve Beagle, who was an alumnus of this, uni of, uh, this university um, and one of the two institutions that, I mean, which uh, uh, he was actually an alumnus of the University of, uh, of, of Natal, uh, which is one of the two institutions that merged uh, to form what we now uh, known as the Investor of Gozul Natal. Through, uh, through such lectures, we, are also, um, pay, we also pay uh, homage uh, to Bigo and many others who uh, gave their lives so that we can enjoy uh, the freedoms we have today. Even this uh, very lecture we are uh, hosting um, today uh, will not only be uh, we will not only be uh, possible without the freedom attained uh, through all uh, the sacrifices and many sacrifices by Bigo and many others. Uh, with those uh, few words, I would like to welcome you, and also um, I hope that uh, we all going to be uh, engaging uh, this 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 afternoon and uh, make sure that uh, we uh, we participate uh, since we are here we are here to make sure we all uh, in the, in the in the same page and also allowing uh, our our keynote uh, speaker to share with us what he uh, has for us this this evening i would like to then um, invite our 
uh, facilitator, Ms. Kenna, to take us through the, 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 the program this afternoon. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, and um, thank you so much to everyone who is joining the program um, this afternoon. Um, we are really, really grateful that you took the time um, to be a part um, of, of this. Um, I'd like to first pass my gratitude to Ngebuli Segu, Ms. Zondo, the Mdapo team, Yonge. Thank you for considering me to host this program. Ngebuli Segu, Mamanziki, and the Biko family, greetings to the speakers. Um, for today, Professor Gordon, Professor Federico, and everyone who's logged on, um, thank you so, so much. Um, and, um, you know, uh, before I take you through the program, I just thought um, I just take this moment to acknowledge what today is. Um, and today is Black Wednesday. It is AKA um, Black Solidarity Day. It was on this day that the apartheid government um, decided to ban 19 organizations of the Black Consciousness Movement. And this particular act literally had such a devastating blow um, to the Black Consciousness Movement that we find ourselves today um, still with a fractured Black community, that we find ourselves today um, still um, you know, trying to almost settle Black consciousness um, in our communities. This day has been so significant. Um, and however, you know, earlier on when we were just musing before the program started, we were just so grateful that there is so much that's been done today. There's over 10 programs where this day is currently um, being commemorated. It's so important that this day is never forgotten. And I just want to remind everybody that's logged on today that um, when this system tries to rewrite our history, when the system tries to uh, repackage history and whitewash it, as we all know, um, today the media, instead of carrying the Black Wednesday story, instead of carrying um, the Black Solidarity Day with its original name, they have called it Media Day. And it's just become about them um, more than it is about Black Solidarity, more than it is about Black consciousness. So we must be wary about how people whitewash our history um, so that we can defocus um, from, from Black consciousness, which is a critical thing. And if you look at today's topic, um, which I quickly want to go back to, to um, uh, and, and look at what the topic is wanting to cover and talk about what it is that Steve Biko was trying to achieve uh, with his life today becomes very, very, very significant. Um, so with that said, um, um, thank you so much for coming through. I'm just going to quickly take you through um, the program. It's not very intense. Um, my gadgets are just giving me a bit of a problem, so I'll use this one a little bit. Um, so we have just, uh, we're going to start with um, Professor Gordon, who is going to give us a keynote. And then we would have uh, Professor Federico Settler, who is then going to be the respondent. Um, then we would have um, a Q and A at some point, because this is not about, you know, being spoken to, it's an engagement, it's a learning session. Um, and we would like to have as much um, of your participation as we possibly can. Um, and without uh, further ado, um, I would like to um, introduce to you our, our guest speaker, um, a very important um, scholar, um, Professor Lewis, uh, an academic from the University of Connecticut in the US, uh, where he is Board of Trustees, a distinguished professor of philosophy and global affairs, uh, philosophy as uh, the head of philosophy and head of department, uh, yeah, as a head of department. Additionally, he is um, honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies and a visiting professor of philosophy at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Professor Gordon also serves as the adjunct professor at the of philosophy of uh, at Fort Hare uh, University and holds the title of distinguished scholar at the most honorable PJ Patterson Center for African Caribbean Advocacy at the at the University of West Indies. Um, 
uh, Professor Gordon's significant contribution to academia were recognized in 2022 when he was honored with the Eminent Scholar Award uh, from the Global Development Studies Division of the International Studies Association in 2023. Uh, Bloomsbury published Black Existentialism and Decolonizing Knowledge. Um, the writings of uh, Professor Lewis R. Gordon, a compilation of some of his most influential writing, uh, which is skillfully edited by Rosanna Mart and Cyan Day. Now, for me, um, I I literally just went on to find some of his lectures, and I find him um, to be quite an accessible speaker. So I'm kind of looking forward um, to hearing what how he breaks down this topic. Uh, Professor Gordon, thank you so much um, for. Um, you know, making yourself available um, to speak to us on, on this very important day. Um, I'm going to give you the platform um, so you could take us through your understanding of the topic of the day. But thank you so, so much for having made the time um, to, to come and speak to us um, this evening. It's not evening. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Kiletso. I'll be drinking a lot because my voice is hoarse. Uh, thank you. Thank you also for just for the honor of being able to speak on this day. Uh, there's something powerfully symbolic if we say Black solidarity with me here on the other side of the Atlantic and with you right there at the Indian Ocean. It's uh, a reminder that we should not make the mistake that has often happened among our people which is to think uh, our specific version is the only one. I often say that everybody thinks their Blacks are the Blacks. And as we know, as we look at issues across the world, uh, we see the consequences of that. So to the audience, to everybody who uh, is here today, uh, Melweni, Sabona, and as you're at KwaZulu-Natal, uh, Durban, that's where one of the uh, great living theoreticians of black consciousness continues to live. And that's Mabojo More. And so to Mabojo More, I say Domela, uh, because uh, also, you know, he speaks to Sesuana. I should add as well, uh, Hotep, which as we know is one of the eight most ancient living languages. It goes all the way back to what the people of Kemet, Kush, Nubia spoke. It means peace. But when we say peace, which also what shalom means and salam, and uh, it's not peace, unfortunately, as the absence of war. And we know the world is at war. Uh, but it's peace in the sense of making whole. That ultimately, in other words, it's for what you fight for. And as we know all over the world right now, um, unfortunately, there are struggles that overshadow many of the others. But humanity is fighting. Humanity is dealing with a profound level of disintegration. So what I'm going to do is speak uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, for about a, uh, 25 minutes to a half hour, okay? And the topic at hand today is Black Consciousness, Radical Humanism and Decolonization, Convergence and Limitations. Now, what I'm going to talk about, what I'm going to argue is that Black Consciousness is a fundamentally political critique of nation state ideology wherein there's a construction of legal and illegal peoples. And that is already exemplified in this day because ultimately to make black consciousness movements, communities illegal is to say they belong outside of the state and a construction of the state as fundamentally supposedly one nation. But here's the problem because as we know with white supremacy, White supremacy is an effort to create the notion of nation premised upon race. And one of the things that becomes very complicated is the notion of a superior race, as Fanon pointed out, already has a problem because it constructs a group of people who are above humanity. 
and in its project to push people below humanity, which is what anti-Black racism is, also becomes an assault on humanity itself, which is one of the reasons the topic at hand about radical humanism becomes significant. But it's even more complicated when we say the Black in Black consciousness, because as we know, there's the Black as constructed by the white supremacists, which looks at the Black as in ways that are non-human. But then there's also the Black, and I call that a capital B Black, which deals with the lived reality of Black people when we look at one another, when we look and ask ourselves what we love, what we need, what life's about. And when we assert our agency, that capital B Black is about the assertion of who we are, our humanity, but in our terms. One of the beautiful things about Biko is that Biko understood that there is no group who owns humanity. Everybody lives it. And if we understand this, we can understand also a reflection that I had the good fortune of back in the 90s. I was asked to write the foreword to I write what I like. And what it struck me in it is that Biko understood very well what it is to have a lie imposed upon a people. And so for as Biko is going to, had argued about the question of black consciousness, the thing that we should bear in mind from when I said that people think their blacks are the blacks, well, many people think that the only legitimate discourse of black consciousness is the one that took place in the South African context. But actually, Black consciousness goes all the way back to the 18th century. What is different is the contributions, the creativity, and the uniqueness of analysis brought to the concept in the South African context. And that was so powerful that it reached us across the globe. I, for instance, in the 1980s, was part of the anti-apartheid struggle, and that's because that vision was so powerful. So my first point is that we don't diminish the contribution by pointing out that there were others. What we need to do is to understand how this contribution is so powerful. And one of them I've already opened up with, because if the state is going to try to fight against its legality, then the state is ultimately trying to outlaw something that's implied in the solidarity. And to save time, I could say ahead before I go through the rest what that is. And that is that people have to talk about democracy and freedom, but they do it hypocritically. There are people, as we know, in the Euro modern world who love to extol freedom while they radicalize the implements of enslavement. There are people who like, who like to talk about democracy, but it's not democracy for all. It's for some people. For instance, the apartheid state, some people had democracy, but not the rest. At the core of Black consciousness is to say, if there's no democracy for all, then one has abdicated its right to any. In short, there's no some democracy model here. There's democracy for everyone. And the way Biko talked about freedom and democracy meant he linked it to the question of political life. And now you may wonder what political life is. Well, the short version is you cannot have political life without power. And as we know, there is a big fear about putting the notion of black with the notion of power. But ultimately, what democracy is about is the empowerment of the people what oppression, colonization, racism, the long list of isms are about, is the disempowering of the people through the privatization of power for some, instead of the public global access to power for all. And you may wonder what I mean by power. Well, you know, people love to talk about power, but they don't define it. And that has created a lot of problems because power has been treated as if it's something evil. 
there's the cliche power corrupts. But power corrupts if you set the conditions for power to be coercive. Most people think about power over, domination, but they don't think about the question of what it means to have the ability to act. All power means is the ability to make things happen with access to the conditions of doing so. If you don't have access to those conditions, you can't do anything. Every one of you on the screen, every one of you, every one of us across the globe can't do a single thing each day without power. And power takes many forms. When, before we came on the screen, we were talking about the fact that we could be all over the world listening, watching this right now, listening to one another. But that power emerged, that's an ability, but the conditions for it came from the brilliance of a woman named Ada Lovelace, who did the, developed the algorithm for the computer, a black man named Louis Latimer, who developed the filament system through which we can see one another, and also the audio system, through a woman by the name of Adi Lamar and a woman called Grace Walker, who developed the wireless technology. Those conditions enable us to communicate. And what Biko understood very well is that politics is about building the conditions for us to be able to live livable lives. And what the apartheid state was about was to block those conditions. So to make the idea of solidarity through which human beings could communicate, build and reorient power to create governance for all, the very act of trying to block that was a war against political life. To put it differently, if you want democracy, the people must be able to exemplify power, politics, empowerment over the building of institutions. Now, one of the things, of course, that we get straight to is that if then Blackness is linked to power and one is blocking power and there's a war against politics, then ultimately there's a form of illegality of political life. And that throws all those who are fighting for freedom, democracy, and political life into the same category of Blackness. And this is very different from racialized Blackness. And this is something that Fanon, but Biko also was able to tease out beautifully. Because you see, uh, the, the, the idea that there's a single essential one group of people who could be Black takes Black out of context, out of relations. And if you look at Biko's analysis, Biko always looked at the relations. And as you could understand with this question of relations, it's precisely because what apartheid is, is the logic of what's called contraries. That means one group of people are universally something and everybody else is outside. But what humanity is, is the interaction of people, which means that it reveals, it takes the clothes off the lies. It reveals the false universalities. And this revelation is dialectical. So the argument for dialectical, in other words, bringing out the contradictions, that is a crucial element in what Biko and many of his comrades we're arguing for with black consciousness. Now, when we think about the notion of illegal people, we have to think about this notion of nation state. And as I said, I'm very critical of the nation state. I'm not against nations, but I'm against the nation state. Because once you put a nation and you put a state that's for one nation, you're going to construct illegal people. You're gonna construct people who don't belong to the nation. And one of the things that's very tricky is because nation and racialization are more complicated. Mm -hmm. Fanon warned against that. So when one says black consciousness, some people confuse it as black nation consciousness. But the thing about blackness that's different from nationness is that blackness is the kind of relation that's more open. And this is something that we could talk about in the Q and A. But it's linked to people like Du Bois, Fanon, Antonia Fanon, Anna Julia Cooper where the understanding is that there's not like a little essence in you that make you black. It's a set of conditions, the way I talked about conditions, and those conditions are connected to power. 
So the logic of contraries constructs societies in binaries, okay? And ultimately, if you're going to fight against those binaries, if you're going to fight for your humanity, if you're going to fight against that dehumanization, that is going to create a situation in which dialectical realities depend upon human interaction. So this connection of black consciousness and the topic of the day is about radical humanism. It is not only the project of what it means to be human. If you're gonna talk about black consciousness and there's a world that claims black people are not human, you could say, look, this is complete nonsense. But if black people were to say to the people who deny our humanity, we're as human as you are, we would have lost. Because you see, we would have made the people who question our humanity the standard. But should we make racism, colonialism, violence, degradation, all of that the standard? If we're going to interrogate the standard, then one of the scary things for people who want fixed worlds is that black consciousness and open the door is saying that ultimately humanity is a radical absence of guarantee, but a commitment for struggles that must be waged. If we understand this then, then the struggle is to construct a world in which there's nowhere in which any human being should be identified in and of themselves as illegal or illicit or outside. Now, this makes black consciousness also plea, as I've already hinted at, not just for democracy, but radical democracy. And because of this, it means it has to be self-critical of democratic practices. This leads then to a convergence with a very popular discourse today, which is decolonization. And it's connected because you see, black consciousness fights against the binary structures, all, none, right? And it also fights against Eurocentrism because the all becomes everything white and Eurocentric, et cetera, that has been imposed upon Euromodern ideas. And we call those Euromodern colonization. Now, among the things, as we know about Euromodern colonization, it's just a big pack of lies. You know, it's really heartbreaking sometimes when I'm in South Africa and I meet people who are unaware, for one, of what the struggle in South Africa meant to the world outside of, you know, South Africa, and two, how much damage has been done by the erasure of the actual history of the people of the African continent. There's, as we know, the obnoxious, condescending, racist attack that's often articulated that demands somehow for Black peoples, brown peoples, and all colonized and enslaved peoples to somehow be grateful for their degradation. It's happening in the US right now where there are people who are trying to act like, uh, what would you be if you were not colonizers, if you would somehow have been in the mess? But this is connected to an urgent need for people who have misrepresented history because they would like us to believe somehow that the carnage, the degradation, the dehumanization, the humiliation, all those things were somehow worth it. But what the truth is, and as Biko in his writings demonstrated, is that the resolute answer is no. The quest for the redemptive narrative, the quest for the idea that all of that was necessary and worth it, uh, no, there could have been another way. And this is part of why the radical humanization is important because radical humanism basically says at the core of questions of what it is to be human, is always to be in touch with that which could be otherwise. There could have been other ways. And in fact, part of the lies is to deny the actual history of a very basic point. People always talk about master's houses, 
But they forget. Masters don't build houses. The people do. Their skills, their strengths. There is so much of this world we live in that's a function of the thousands of years of creativity that was on the African continent, was on the Asian continent, and what humanity pre-Euromodern Euro -modern colonialism offered. And we should not forget those tools because you see, the effort to make us forget those tools is to sneak like a worm into our consciousness, the idea that those tools didn't exist because we were incapable of producing them. And that is one of the fundamental lies. Biko's critique of capitalism and liberalism, that is also very important for us to deal with many of these issues because that critique is also shared with decolonial theory. Again, we have a short time, but his critique of capitalism is very straightforward. Capitalism depends on the privatization of power. So if you're going to argue for the public access to power, mm -hmm. capitalism is antipathetic to it. I don't have time here to spell out my, my conception of other problems with capitalism, but a short version is that when you hear capitalists speak and you hear about capitalism, there's this term called the market. And it's a lot like what I said earlier where people said, say they're Blacks or you know, they're Jews or they're Muslims and so forth. Well, the market is a capitalist fantasy because its goal is to eradicate other markets. And part of capitalism is that the problem with the plurality of markets is that they're too human. So fundamentally capitalism at its core is an anti-humanism. Liberalism is more complicated, and Biko beautifully teased this out. But you could see you could see it in Fanon and others. But Biko had added almost like, I mean, it's interesting. He was you know he's a physician. Fanon was a physician, and they had this skill. It's almost as if they had a scalpel. And what Biko pointed out is that the thing with liberalism is that liberalism has this concept of neutrality. But you see. It, it, neutrality, it creates such an abstraction that ultimately there's no way to articulate how you're harmed as a group. So the idea that in apartheid South Africa, when you know the state is against you as black or brown, the idea that you have to come with your grievance as an individual erases the very conditions against you were, which you were attacked. And so it leads to a form of sliding under the rug and a form of evasion of the real issue. I usually put it this way, and uh, I put it this way in one of my recent books. If you imagine a woman and a man, I'll make it heteronormative at the moment, go out at a date and a man says at the end of the date, I had a great time. The woman said, I had a great time. He said, there's only one thing that could make it better. And she says, what? He said, if I could just not see you as a woman, I can respect you. I usually say to my students, I ask them, is there a second date? And they usually say, hell no. Because a man who does, has, to see, has to not see a woman as a woman in order to respect her is a man who doesn't respect women, a man who's misogynist. But in effect, liberalism has, says, I must not see color. I must not see you in order to respect you. And Biko gave a trenchant critique of that. Now that is shared in a lot of decolonial theory, okay? Now, additionally, the understanding that colonization is not only of a material resource, it's not only grabbing land and owning the material capital, but it's also about institutions of power as I've been already highlighting. And that institution of power, as you could guess from the way I talked about power, is fundamentally social. And this requires addressing our mind, our relationship to the social world in which we live. As Gugi Watayongo put it out, said it very beautifully, decolonization cannot work without decolonization of the mind. It is far more effective to have a dominated people work within the implements of their own domination, of their self-domination, than to dev devote so many resources material resources to dominating them. 
And this is where the notion of decoloniality comes in. Because decoloniality argues that coloniality is to be wedded to the set of norms or values and institutions and ways and concepts that lock you in colonial relationships. This is something that Fanon noticed in the Damne de la Terre, the damned of the earth, or as many know, the wretched of the earth. Because he noticed that most decolonial struggles, well, not decolonial, decolonization struggles, were efforts simply to replace the players, but not the game. The whole point of that book, a lot of people misunderstand that book. It wasn't written to white people in Europe. It wasn't being written to the dominators. It was being written to the revolutionaries who are trying to change the system. And what Fanon had noticed, and this is something Biko picked upon, was that if all you're fighting for is just to replace those who dominated you, but you are wedded to the game that produces dominating people, then you're just replacing one form of oppression for another. And so if one is going to be engaged, in these struggles, one has to get at the core concepts that produce them and start building different institutions. And I could tell you at a cultural level, you can see this, it's the political issue. If you look at most independent states or if you look at a post-apartheid moment, everybody culturally was reaching out to the world. They become everything from South African styles of doing everything from hip hop, to jazz, to pizza. And this is the same in the Caribbean, the same in South Asia, et cetera. But Fernand said, but wait, 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 wait a minute. You're doing all of this cultural celebration that is creating new vibrant forms of life, but you've kept intact the institutions of power, the institutions that set, and those are education, religion, economies, governing structures, the list, the list is many. If you keep those intact, all you've done is change some players and you've made one layer of being able to at least connect with others, but you've kept the game intact that holds onto your heels and are pulling you into the ground. So if we come into decolonial thought, decolonial thought builds on Fanon and Biko. I've often have to remind remind the colonial thinkers about the importance of Biko or people like Nkrumah, Cabral, uh, the list is many. And within that framework, unfortunately, quite often, an effort to be critical of the game sometimes leads to a reassertion of the game. And that's where the question of limitations, because we're asked to talk about that today. If you look at, for instance, a lot of decolonial theory, it's very moralistic. And moralism is one of the things that are at home with liberalism because it treats the individual as if the individual were a God who could fix things by just changing her, his, or their moral sentiment. But the problem with that, as we know, is that you could in the conflict say, okay, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'll be more, more, more moral. And you go home keeping your, your hoarding of power, and the person who is without much power could say, okay, yes, you are immoral, and go home living in crap. So ultimately, and this is why Biko and Black consciousness and this day is important, a political solution doesn't stop at the question of moralistic appeals. In fact, if you can change the game, a few immoral individuals are irrelevant. In fact, that's the biggest fear of white supremacy and anti-Black racism and all forms of colonization and all forms of dehumanization, which is that those who are the perpetuators one day become irrelevant. Not dead, irrelevant. Now, um, within decolonial thought, many of, you know, a lot of it came out of people who were involved with political economy, some were academics, et cetera. There are many, you know, there are complex connections to Samir Amen and Euros, his critique of Eurocentrism. But many do follow what I call genealogical post-structuralism. I know that's a mouthful. But basically, genealogical post-structuralism argues about the relationship of power and knowledge. 
And it often leads to a, a form of anti-humanist and post-humanist forms of decolonial theory. There are people who are act like the human is an abomination. The pro there are many problems with that. Uh, for one thing, what uh, decolonial theory did was to replace power knowledge with coloniality and then argue you have to have decoloniality. But the pro problem is what's snuck in there is the notion of the human as colonial. And if the human is structured as colonial, then the project becomes to get rid of the human. But that makes it very incoherent, the fact of dehumanization and how do you handle dehumanization through erasing your humanity. But it also creates the lie that the very notion of humanity and being human was constructed by colonizers. It sneaks in the idea that the only source of concepts, knowledge, science, everything comes from colonization and it erases our own history. And again, this is where my professor's hat comes in. I often have to, when I teach like my classes on philosophy, I don't begin with a bunch of Greek guys sitting around in Athens. When I teach philosophy, I have a piece of writing that my students begin with from 4,000 years ago by an African, by the name of Antef. And I don't do it to be reactionary to Europe. It's just a fact that philosophy is more than 2,500 years old. And that and Antef 4,000 years ago refers to ancient texts in Africa. And this is crucial because that's demonstrating the truth rather than proselytizing it. But the crucial point is you could see many concepts about how we talk about our humanity from antiquity and throughout and in many struggles. There are so many concepts and ideas that so many of us read that we think were created by white people or by men that were by women and by people of Africa. It's not that white people and white men don't create things. All human beings create them. But we should not abrogate or deny our creative spirit, our ability to build new concepts and to build new houses. So to conclude, okay, at this point, we should be critical of the kinds of decolonial theories that are anti-modernist. Because you see, that sneaks in the idea that modern is only colonial. But all modern means is to belong to the present. And if you belong to the present, you can only belong to the present if you have a future, because be, living in the present has possibilities. What colonialism did was to try to tell colonized peoples that they, or I could say we, because I was born in a colony, belong exclusively to the past. They construct the notion of the primitive, and the primitive, because belonging to the past, could only haunt the present and has no future. How can you have liberation? How can you ultimately fight for freedom if you don't set the conditions, which is connected to power, of having a future? So Black consciousness, um, at least in the line from Biko, I argue, you don't have to agree with me, but I argue, is neither pessimistic nor optimistic. There's a naivety in optimism because it has a presupposition of knowing the future. But there's a, the, same, the same coin in pessimism because it throws onto the future an in advance judgment. What Biko was about was political commitment. And with that, it enabled him to do something that enabled us to commemorate him today and so many others because he understood that the fight for livable lives, for futures of dignity, freedom, and as a physician, he understood health. Health not simply about the body, but social health and respect. And that is what Fanon and Biko called to become actional. And you know what happens when you become actional? When you become politically engaged, you're fighting for those whom you will never know, whom you will never meet, but you have replaced hate with a powerful, powerful force and radicality of love. 
And if that work is done well, because Biko had no reason to know any of us who are meeting today, what we say to Biko is what the future could say to us if we do our work right. And that is those powerful words, simply, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much um, for those um, insights. And you know, what excites me about um, how you break this down is, is how you actually speak to where we find ourselves as a nation today um, and how you talk about, um, you know, how we replace the, the, the players and we are not changing the game. You talk about how we don't even understand the concept of what power means anymore because we don't understand that it's actually in its purest definition is access to the conditions to change things. Um, and in South Africa, we, we have what we call an, um, a poisoned chalice, which is what we inherited in 1994. And I suppose the failures of the Black consciousness movement is the, the actual results, which was that, that chalice. What, did, what, what were the failures of Black consciousness? Why do we find ourselves in the place where we are, where we have this poison chalice, where people actually don't have the means and the access to the conditions um, that are supposed to change the lives of our people so many years later. Um, but also how today, because we have failed to use um, the foundations of our forefathers, we seem to have failed to eradicate the notion of illegal humans. Because if you look at the South African condition and the xenophobic um, attacks that we have uh, on each other. We are only entrenching what the colonizer has done, but I'm supposed that is a conversation we can have um, when we do come back. Um, right now, I am going to ask um, our respondent, Professor Frederico Settler, um, who is an academic a teacher, um, teaching and learning school of religion, philosophy and classics, uh, is also in the College of Humanities at the University of KwaZulu-Natal um, to uh, respond. Um, Professor Settler, um, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, so uh, for that introduction. And Prof. Gordon, thank you very much for your thought-provoking um, and engaging keynote. Um, to the people in the audience, I'd like to just clarify that the uh, the blackness, the darkness behind me is not a, a vain aesthetic, but it's just the fact that I'm in the middle of a power outage. And uh, yeah, so so uh, there's, there, there is background behind me. Uh, so it's not some kind of vain effort. From That's Gordon, I want to just... <laughs> <laughs> You're quite embarrassed by it. Um, anyway, thank you for your, for your keynote. It reflects, of course, uh, your own long tradition and scholarship. Um, in Africana studies, philosophy, race, phenomenology, humanism, and um, I know from my own reading of your work, also in reflections on religion, or at least spirituality. Um, also wish to recognize your own long-standing relationship with UKZN, as you mentioned earlier, colleagues that you've read with before and for over several decades. I'm thinking here of former and current colleagues like Richard Pethouse, uh, Professor Mbokumore, who you mentioned earlier, and uh, current colleague, Pro Professor Rosina Mart, uh, to name only but some. So thank you, because I, I take what you say in recognition of your intimate knowledge of the transatlantic relevance um, of the questions of Blackness and, and, and humanness. But I'm also particularly privileged uh, to respond here uh, today to this keynote because of our shared interest in Franz Fanon um, in terms of scholarship as well as the fact for me that I'm trying to wrap up uh, the writing of a personal and intellectual biography of uh, uh, Sabel Ontoasa, who was a close colleague and friend of Steve Biko's. Um, so this has kind of just kind of given me that motivation to, uh, to, to continue that, that important work. Um, I found what you had to say, your, your approach to the theme um, that's been selected, I suppose, by, by the organizing committee, as it relates to the theme of this memorial lecture provocative, um, but also with 
strong resonances as you yourself uh, cited uh, Dem de la Terre. Um, and I was thinking in particular of uh, pitfalls of national culture and, and it's kind of cautioning um, of the decolonial activists or anti-colonial activists as they kind of assume uh, positions of leadership and imagine a, a certain kind of future. Another thing that sort of struck me as I was thinking in preparation of today was, and I know you're probably familiar with the work of Abakhlale um, in Durban South and their notion where they take that continuity of uh, Franz Fanon and Steve Biko in the development of a practice, a praxis that places humanness at the center of their dialogue and they premise on this idea of, uh, that all of their efforts, collaborating and transformative effort has kind of the experience of the common people um, at the heart of it. And a lot of Abakhale Basun Yondolo's work comes as response of, uh, as a response to kind of xenophobic attacks and wanting to draw lines of differentiation between different uh, groups of people who uh, were resident in, what well, our resident were at the time in 2008. I'm not going to take tons of time, but there are a couple of uh, things that I want to just draw out and obviously some questions that I have. I found I made some additional points as you spoke through, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be um, like when you were speaking about political life as building the conditions uh, for us to live a livable, livable lives. I think that is so profound and so provocative. And I also like the way you link this to radical humanism and your critique of regimes and technologies that demarcate and mark some people as legal and others as illicit. Um, and for me, it raises questions about how we manage this kind of, in I want to say epistemic plurality, but I also hear your own caution in your critique of decoloniality when we only privilege that, then there's a problem. But, it did raise for me some questions about Georgia Agamben's work around states of exception, how the state, even the post-colonial state, and yeah, I'm thinking about Priti Patel or the British government's relationship with various African states to create these kind of spaces of exception where certain illegalities are being reproduced, a kind of outsourcing of colonialism um, in the modern era. And, and so the linking of and uh of, of capitalism uh, here for me was, was really striking. Now, I want to ask how we navigate difference in the context of nation building that is that often relies on such things as xenophobia and other forms of dehumanization, right? So, so how does radical humanism help us navigate that terrain? In particular, I want to ask, how do you propose we ad advocate for radical humanism that places being human or humanness at the center of the sort of political enterprise, also continuing to recognize the insights and experiences of those people who are regarded, were historically regarded, or who may regard themselves as marginal or in situations that are precarious, that it doesn't just kind of uh, I know you offered a critique of the sort of post-structuralist approaches to decoloniality, but I wondered if you could elaborate. How do we hold those things in tension? The kind of the pain, the scars of history whilst centering humanism. What might, also then related to that, what might radical humanism, as you'd advocated it here today, offer South Africa 30 years after apartheid, in efforts to uncouple ourselves from those kinds of mindsets. So on the one side, we want to uncouple ourselves from the mindsets, and there's lots of efforts to do that, as I'm sure you are well aware. Um, I'm just curious what, what that might look like, because I have a similar curiosity about what is this future, this, as you define it, a livable future that we are in pursuit of, right, in, in our kind of uh, critique of race and coloniality. But what, what does that future look like and how does uh, kind of help us in that task? And a second sort of key point that I take from your presentation, you argued that black consciousness converges with kind of decolonizing efforts in its critique of capitalism and liberalism. 
Um, and here I imagine you refer to, this is a critique of kind of material difference, institutions of power, social worlds, as well as kind of thinking, how we think about uh, the relationship between capitalism and liberalism, and you gave some good examples of that. And I'm, when I was thinking on that, I thought of the work of Gloria Anzaldúa in her work on border thinking, um, in terms of border thinking, allowing for a critique of geospatial, the civic, the racial and gendered, but also the shamanistic and the esoteric. So here's a sociologist of religion. Um, and I know you probably have some thoughts in this regard because you reference kind of a couple of faith traditions uh, at various points. What, if any, place does the shamanistic or the indigenous esoteric have in this critique, this critique of capitalism? And liberalism. Some general remarks uh, for me, because uh, I was thinking in preparation for this of the work of Kalela Magengo um, in his biography on Biko, um, when he engages the work of Daniel Magaziner and Nigel Gibson to point out that in the post-colonial context, we are not just looking for potential political solutions, but new ways of being human. You are saying that if I understood you correctly, that centering the human is the political task. So I, I just wondered if, if, I, if I got that correct or if you could uh, clarify that for me um, some more. Um, also, I let me just reference here Rosina Mart, who in her article, I think from 2016, about how Black consciousness works, walks and arm in arm, um, uh, with I think it's critical whiteness studies, she suggests that when we address questions of racialization, we often need to engage in practices where we refuse to feel like the problem. And black conscience for me has to be part of, so I was wondering what the place of black consciousness is in knowledge production or what the place of knowledge production is in the radical humanism as you advocated it. Um, so I, I was just wondering, did I hear correctly that you cautioned us to excessively privilege the focus on decolonization uh, as only or primarily a question of competing epistemes? Um, now, these provocations I raise for me questions about what does it mean to be free, both kind of in terms of the ontological and epistemic tradition? And I was wondering if you can elaborate your critique of the different forms of decolonization, um, including the reference to the anti-modernist and I put slash essentialist traditions. I wondered if you could maybe say something a little bit about that. Um, and then lastly, for me, in the closing, it's in the closing postscript, really, it's a, a memoir of Elred Stubbs in the Picador edition of I Write What I Like. Um, every time I read that particular passage, that, that memoir, I am struck by how no less than three times he mentions Black conscious activists meeting at parties, festive gatherings, eating, drinking, dancing, playing cards, poetry, and so forth. So I was wondering, what in your view is the role and place of aesthetics in your radical humanism or Biko's vision of livable futures? Um, and here I just want to close with returning to Franz Fanon's pitfalls of national culture and Biko's critique of liberalism, capitalism. What personhood or what idea of humanity should be at the heart of our efforts to pursue livable futures? And, and, and I, I keep referencing this because I feel in often when I speak to my students, I, 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 I think about what we are critiquing and what we are moving towards so we're not arrested in this continuous 
practice of critique, but are actually actively constructing uh, something new. And I, in July 2020, during a video conferencing meeting with a colleague from the US, we discussed the ramifications of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, social as well as its implications for the classroom. As two scholars of color, we shared our respective desires to provide a space for our students to speak and reflect on the meaning of violence in the context of racial inequality and injustice as it manifested on both sides of the Atlantic at that time. Two things that was, two things were striking about our conversation for me was in the first instance that we shared a deep desire to make space for and to honor the embodied experiences of our students as they shared their experience of racialized violence uh, that stretched at that point across the Atlantic. The second striking issue was our shared despair and pessimism that this happened before and will happen again. And we felt like we were left with a conundrum about how do we teach our children, our students to be alert to the seriousness of this, at that time, this moment of violence directed at their bodies and a sense of belonging in the world while also teaching them to arm themselves against the stubborn persistence of white supremacy and imagine a possible future where persons of color, black people with the big D can live and thrive. Uh, but those are my more remarks than I think I had initially planned, but I really enjoyed listening to you. And it, it linked with a number of uh, key things I myself have been reflecting on. And I don't necessarily expect you to respond to all of it, but uh, some, some remarks from you would be most welcome because I know we also want to invite comments from the, the, the people in attendance here today. Professor Gordon, thank you so very much uh, for your provocative address. Professor Settler, thank you for that. That was wonderful. It is a wonderful, it is a, um, a gracious part two, so to speak. Uh, since I think we only have an, a half hour, I think what might be good, uh, because um, there, I think there are people with questions, I could yeah. integrate them into my response. That way we make sure that I could get to participate. Okay? Yeah. Great. So. Um, how do we do this? Are there the questions on the side? Yeah, um, so, uh, Professor, there's been some questions, but I thought maybe we should respond to Professor Frederico's ones. And then what I can do is maybe read them out to you so that you are able to um, to respond to them. But um, there's not there's been a lot more comments than questions. And some of them are pretty much um, the same uh, questions that Professor Federico raised. Um, for instance, there's one about um, Comrade Biko fought for and died for all people in South Africa to be recognized as equal citizens in SA. All of them would have been, would have the right to vote to elect a government that will move their desires and dreams forward. I and a million South African citizens hope that South Africa would have been moving in that direction after 1994. The reality is that post-1994, we've created many new billionaires, enriched many, but seemingly education, infrastructure, service delivery, employment have not improved the lives of our citizens. What exactly are we doing wrong? I know it's a loaded question. Uh, it's an honest question from someone who was BC uh, a long time. Um, but also um, part of that could be the fact that the successful good quality of life became packaged as solely an individual. Uh, enterprise uh, and not also a consequence of systemic and institutional support structures. The idea that people are only poor because they have not worked hard enough, which is what we are dealing with in the country. Um, when and, and also maybe if you could reference that to the, the stuff that you spoke about, about the, the power to access the conditions um, that, you know, that changes things. Um, um, and also, I suppose some of the stuff that Professor Andrew, uh, Federico raises um, on the on on, the, on on how do we imagine a livable future in South Africa, and how does um, radical humanism help South Africa to to move forward? Um, some of the questions that are coming up. Um, somebody says it's actually not xenophobia, but it's Afrophobia. So when I spoke about xenophobia, and he's correct. It's us just really rehashing what the colonizer did in separating the continent, and how do we then? Um, 
change that. Um, somebody says, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Lewis, how do we give an effective critique of South Africa as a white nation that is managed by blacks who continue to perpetuate white privilege with the continued exclusion and humiliation of black people. And I'd like to also add to that for you, uh, Professor, the notion of how you speak about the humanity of um, whiteness, where when you say a white man, or when you say a man, automatically people think of a white man because other races must have a prefix. It's a black man, it's an Indian man. It's, you know, there's a prefix to everybody else in terms of their humanity. Maybe if you could also add to that. Um, perhaps somebody says, um, um, thank you very much for these powerful perspectives and so necessary and urgent too for analysis, global realities of today. It aligns, um, uh, sorry, one second, I think I lost that. My apologies. Um, Analysis of global alliance with thinking and works of indigenous elder William Commander Circle of All Nations, yes. Um, and also how how we learn from you know all nations in terms of where we are in the country. Um, but maybe let's stop there and give you an opportunity to respond and then we can come back to some of the other questions. Okay, and I'll I'll read out one that I see in the QA. It's from I think it's Hussein Vauda. Uh, dear Professor Gordon, thank you for your presentation. And the question is, I'd like to raise is not that South Africa now has a democracy which is based on blackness of the people of the Rainbow Nation as described by late Emeritus, Arch, Emeritus Archbishop Tutu. However, there's a divided black nation, the elite and non-elite. In my personal analysis, group one looks down upon group two as well as lesser mortals and discriminates. Could South Africa after the 2024 general elections end up like the countries in history where there's a civil war between the two groups mentioned above, that is the elite and the non-elite, irrespective of the other minorities who perceive the situation, a reversed apartheid in the country. Appreciate your analysis to preserve Ubuntu, Matapele, or humanity in Western terms, noting the abysmal decay in moral and traditional values of the great African tradition and culture. How can South Africa obviate the disharmony? Thank you. Okay, so first, the first thing I'd like to say is, thank you all. For me, when I give a presentation, it's not for you simply to learn from me, but for all of us to learn from one another. And this is one of the reasons why what Professor Settler just did was so beautiful, because it brought in additional questions and many of you in the discussion responded to that. I also thank you for bringing up Abitel Ali Bes Monjulu. I was uh, at the Franz Fedot School that was created in Durban last Friday speaking, and they post posted on YouTube if you'd like to see that. That group exemplifies in so many ways much of what I was talking about, precisely because one of the challenges, as you know, that's being dealt with in the post colonial state raised its precisely by, for instance, the question I just read, is the very idea of continuing the game and just simply switching the players. Because ultimately the very conception of land, for instance, that's being discussed in post-apartheid South Africa, is already complicit with the notion of the, de the dehumanized relationship to land. In other words, land exclusively in the construction of property, which is not how humanity across the globe historically understood land. They understood land in terms of conditions of possibility for life, which is connected to the question of very empowerment. The ultimate land, for instance, for all of us, is this planet Earth. We get we lose that, and we are proverbially effed. Now, there are other things as we, we talk about that are very crucial. And because we have such a short time, uh, it would take it take much to elaborate. Uh, I talk about some of these issues, not only in my book, Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, and other books, and a lot in the uh, Black Exist Attention and Decolonizing Knowledge. But beyond those, I must say to all of you that one of the errors we have inherited is the reductive thinking of looking at ourselves as things and looking at the world as things. That's the property reductive view. If we understand ourselves as relationships, that in building relationships produce new relationships. What we begin to understand is that when I talk about things like livable life, and I've been thinking a lot about this of late, it is 
a critique of the notion that simply giving people certain material things and moralizing will be sufficient. But the example that was given about what, not only what uh, was involved in the struggle, the way Biko would talk about everything from card games to dancing to food. And we were talking about that about Talali based Banjola last week. But the, the, what people don't understand is that, you see, we live in a disclosed reality we call a human world. And in that world, when we are drained of it, we suffer despair. You can give people a lot of the material things and they'll go and commit suicide. They'll walk off of a cliff because they don't see meaning. Part of what it is to build livable lives requires the communicative practices through which we connect. I was talking with some friends, uh, Michael Neocosmos last week, but others. I've been talking with people all over the country. I was talking with Mabajo More about it as well, that something I'm writing on is dancing. There are many forms. I write a lot of food. I actually, I'm a chef, I do food, but I write in dancing. And you see, one of the errors we're having is we live in a highly litigious society in which processes of lawfare or legalization, right, are beginning to cover over or close off our capacities for socialization. And within that framework, they lock us into ourselves so much that we become perfect neoliberal subjects. You know, one of the funny things about dancing is you can dance by yourself and just have joy in your body. But it's interesting when you dance with a group. Because when you dance with a group, they see you, you see them. It's a Sabona moment. And within that framework, uh, you are profoundly vulnerable. Because there are people at a moment of joy, you are now with abandon. And what's striking about communal dancing is that you don't have to be good at it. In fact, it's even better if you're a terrible dancer because what you've learned is a community that loves you because you're not performing for them, you're performing with them. And that co-living, that conviviality is part of as a great metaphor for what it is to build lives of living together. And you would find it in ancient African concepts. It's in Mayat, for instance. Mayat is not just about balance and justice and all that. It's also about breath and it's about movement. And when we think about this, this is one of the reasons why I do think real meditations on health, is they're very important because livable lives are lives with meaning. And ultimately, what's the point if there were a community where you dance with them and you're thrown out because you don't dance right? That's a community that is ossified dancing into a thing. And the aesthetic dimension then that Professor Settler brought up is crucial. For me, the aesthetic dimension is not like an add-on. It's not like a side dish. It's at the very core of existence. Because you see, we all know this. Reality was perfectly fine before, without us. Before a single human being popped up, before even life popped up. And we know there will be a time when at least within this solar system, there's no life. And it'll be perfectly fine without us. So we waste our time when we take ourselves too seriously because we don't look at the life we have that we have an opportunity to make valuable together. And this is what the agents of privatization fear. You see, one of the unfortunate the tragedies of South Africa, there are many other countries with this too, but the tr South African situation was that it was brokered by the United States. Because the United States, if you go and look back in that period, from the Reagan administration to the George Herbert Bush administration, they were part of the project to create neoliberalism and neoconservatism. And the mantra of neoliberalism and neoconservatism is privatization. And because of that, really, honestly, seriously, how are you going to simply put, uh, it is important to have voting and those things. Those are legal mechanisms in a democracy, but that is not democracy. 
because ultimately it has separated democracy from those conditions through which people can actually be able to participate in ways that matter. You see, if you look at the history of what created structural white wealth and structural white hegemony, uh, it's often misrepresented. It's presented as if there is something intrinsic in white people, intrinsic in their individuality, that make them simply succeed. But that's actually not true. If you look at the actual history of human time, but the point at which white supremacy emerged, in its initial stage, it didn't give a damn about anybody other than just the naked accumulation of wealth. However, the point at which white supremacy began to follow, it can't work if you're gonna have structural white poverty all over the world and structural white degradation. And so if you go and look at the history of those societies, there was a concerted effort to build more social and socialist oriented political economies. It's just that they made them for whites only. The proof that socialism works in a nutshell is white wealth. If they did not have those socialist mechanisms, there would just be some really crappy poor as white people in addition to all kinds of things around. And in fact, the backlash today of white conservatism and white fascism is that the effort to make it more equal, but with privatization means to screw over everybody. And what they want is the good old days. Well, no, no, you only screw over the blacks and the browns, but you create safe mechanisms for the whites. Well, that was apartheid South Africa. You know, I have relatives in South Africa, biological relatives, not just relatives through, through marriage, who are white. And uh, they're, you know, some of my relatives, they're not particularly talented. They're not particularly the greatest, most brilliant people on the earth. But the standard of living that the socialism for whites afforded them was so high. So the idea that you're going to make a transition in 1994 without those social mechanisms for the entire society was a recipe for disaster. And it was a recipe that was devised and brokered through the United States because the United States doesn't measure health or wealth by how the society as a whole participates. It measures it by profits. And that's why you could have in post-apartheid South Africa, billionaires and millionaires, and people could say a good economy when there are people who have to walk three hours just to be able to get a few rands to be able to get a slice of bread. That is not a healthy society. And part of this, if we're going to talk about the more complicated question, which is how it connects to the, to the way I was talking about humanization, you see what Fanon noticed and Cabral noticed, Vico noticed this too, is that part of the way we get duped is to ossify or to treat as absolute or the fancy word is ontological. Human institutions as if they were given to us by God. Human institutions depend upon human actions for them to breathe, for them to live, for them to foster. And when they are failing, they depend on human actions to let go of them and build alternatives. The thing about the way we talk about states and nations, Fanon, for instance, made a distinction between nationalism and national consciousness. Nationalism is when you take the position that one nation is more valuable than another. National consciousness is when you're conscious of what any, everybody in the society shares and need to build. And that means you don't know the outcome before the performance. It is the act of building, like the act of dancing, that is going to produce the connections and the institutions. People talk about states like they fall out of the sky. They don't. States are relations of power that people build. And what, what many people don't understand, this is what Fanon was criticizing Engels for in The Damned of the Earth. 
because Engels started with an advanced notion of the state as coercive. But, if, but he didn't bring the question in of who is invested in making a coercive state. Fanon began to realize very astutely that we have a new global imperative. And we have a new global imperative because we, in the third decade of the 21st century, don't live on the same kind of planet as our ancestors. Our ancestors still whisper in our ear, but we live on a planet of 8 billion people with technologies of being able to traverse space in a very short amount of time. Right now, in, a nano, in under a nanosecond, I'm communicating with you all across the globe. When time, the time it takes to cover space is shorter, space shrinks. To put it differently, we live on a smaller planet. And on a smaller planet, it means the communicative, the connecting, the complex ways in which we must live is like being cramped on a lifeboat. And that means we need to develop. It's not just about building trains and planes and buildings. We need to develop values that actually make sense on a smaller planet. To be sitting in this, this is my piece, your piece, as if we have all this real estate in the world, is nonsense. And as we begin to understand this, it means we have to start setting the conditions for a global understanding of organizing power in which nowhere on this planet people are illegal, which means the mobility of people can be such that in order to retain people in certain places because of the absent coercive forces, there have to be forces that make staying in certain places attractive. And what is that but livable conditions? And, and here's the thing, the right wing know this. There are think tanks that were done at Stanford, like the Hoover Institute, the Manhattan Project in New York, the Heritage Foundation, there are right wing think tanks across Europe and in South Africa and in Asia because they know the truth. The truth is the future of humanity depends on public globalization, not private globalization. And a lot of people in what we call the left made the big mistake of letting the language of globalization be governed by the right. And that's why everybody talks about globalization in terms of corporations and privatization, but not in terms of mobility, not in terms of what it is versus why do we have this nonsense in societies where we have presidents and prime ministers and all of that? Why don't we have global councils that work from the bottom up for people to be able to set up conditions and rotate them across the planet? How are we even going to deal with climate change when we're going to have somebody who's going to act like their nation locked the state can, as long as they got their peace, F the rest of humanity? If we have a global conditions in which we take custodianship and we learn from our ancestors about stewardship, if we deal with the concepts, the wonderful question, for instance, and the point about, for instance, when we talked about the shamanism, et cetera, why not? Because you see, who says the small category of rationality articulates all there is about reality. The truth of the matter is reality is multidimensional. The truth of the matter, matter is every time we communicate, we create, we think, we're tapped into what actually transcends our immediate, our immediate condition. And so what we need is all, all resources on deck. There's so much to learn. And indeed, even in the category of medical science, even in the category of agronomy, there are people who are beginning to realize the wisdom of what people actually were developing that work well for their environment. And we now have to figure out what works well when our environment is the planet itself. Anyway, there's a lot more, but I know that we have limited time. But thank you so much. And I hope all of you, especially those of you who can communicate with one another, continue these discussions and do write me so we can, because uh, there's a lot I could learn from you. I'm not Moses with the tablets. I'm a comrade 
who is trying to learn with other comrades. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lewis. Um, and in the interest of time, I will not be able to read so many of these wonderful questions and comments that we have received. Um, a lot of it is going to be um, on the on the on the uh, on the post um, event. Um, uh, uh, recording as so I suppose people can interact with it and as Professor Lewis says um, people can in fact write to him and interact with him. Um, I'm just trying to, I'm going to try very quickly um, to close off this session um, and really and truly um, I want to thank you for um, a phenomenal evening I've spent with both Professor Gordon and Professor Settler. Um, as I close the session, I'd be amiss if I don't mention that Mtapo has actually hosted this lecture series for over 15 years, which is a testament of their commitment to ensuring that Steve Biko's vision to educate for liberation is realized. Um, you know, um, just as a as a parting shot, Steve Biko speaks of black consciousness, black consciousness consciousness as a quest for humanity. He speaks on how um, on the other side of, of, of this, we could just bestow humanity within an egalitarian society, a society where all peoples have intrinsic value. Um, the world has sadly gone inwards, where capital continues to diminish um, human value and particularly of black bodies, making the quest to eradicate the notion of illegal humans a more urgent one. Thank you, Professor Gordon, for reminding us that in the 70s, when we raised fists in the strong black power salute, and we shouted Amandla, power to the people, black power, we were using the power and energy of words to invoke in us the need to go and fight for the power to change things, not to replace the players in the same game that dehumanizes our people. Thank you, Professor Federico, for probing the issues of what it means to be free, to help guide the discussion, to help us imagine what a livable future could look like if we dared to challenge the insatiable monster of capitalism and craft a more common future where we can all just be human. Um, I'm now going to um, quickly hand over um, to, sorry, one second. Sorry, sorry, sorry. My, my system is just letting me down here. Um, I'm just going to hand over um, so that we can have um, closure of the program so that we can release people. We literally have literally two more minutes uh, of the program. But Thank you so much, Professor Lewis and Professor Federico for spending the time with us. We really appreciate it. Greeting every, greetings, everyone. Um, it's a very short time, but on behalf of uh, UMTAPO uh, and the university as co-hosts of this uh, wonderful uh, webinar uh, today, uh, I want to extend our thanks to all the attendees uh, and of course to uh, Professor Gordon and Professor Settler, uh, both of you, I think have brought immense value to trying to, in a very practical way, illustrate what the livable life uh, is all about. And I must say, I was quite impressed with that uh, concept that has been introduced uh, to explain things quite practically and fundamentally. Uh, there are, I'm not going to uh, go into a long uh, discussion around all of this, but it, my task is to uh, just put out the, uh, a few words of thanks to the amazing organizers of this particular session today. Uh, the lecture uh, has a long history and the involvement of the university together with Mtapo is a very established one, which has over the years brought many wonderful discussions uh, to the numerous attendees 
who have participated. And indeed, I think in all of that, we have learned from each other. And hopefully we will continue to learn from each other. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Kekoletso for ably facilitating this program. Uh, the professor uh, or Ms. Norma Zondo from the UKZN, the executive director, corporate relations. Uh, we would like to express our gratitude for always assisting with this lecture and for this to become part of your events uh, for the year. Uh, to Pam Adams, who over the years has become synonymous with the lecture. And there is a lot of hard work that occurs behind the scenes. Herself together with uh, Arun Pumazile from Umtapo, Dina Salia, uh, have done an amazing job over the years and continue to do so. And thank you for putting all of this together very, very ably. Uh, we had uh, preparations engaged. And with all of that, you facilitated this uh, exceptionally. Uh, hopefully, uh, to for the way forward, what has occurred today could be a precursor to many engagements. Uh, the invitation has been put out there by Professor Gordon to um, interact. Uh, hopefully, we can all dance together at some point so that we could move forward. Uh, Thank you all, and with uh, these few concluding uh, expressions, uh, we bring this to closure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks, and if you're curious, Thank and if you're you. curious Good evening. that painting was done by Sula Gordon. Sula is a Zulu name, and you could see it as the family at the table. I saw someone wrote something about poverty, and the whole idea is for all humanity, we are in poverty. Thank you. Fantastic. Rock Gordon. Thank you. Take care, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Gordon. Thank you, Professor Settler, Ecoletso. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be in touch, and I will send you the recording, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be well, everybody. Goodbye. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. All the best.